I can't see all of you, but um, welcome to our INSU Prisons virtual event. It's today, May 23rd, 2022. And my name is Nadine Cronfley, and I'll be moderating this session alongside my executive colleague, Julia Sheehan. Um, we have 130 participants registered for this event from 25 countries, and uh, we're so honored to have um, great speakers and the company of individuals who are interested in this research. So welcome, and I hope we have a great event. So for those of you who don't know what INSU is, it's the International Network on Health and Hepatitis and Substance Users. It's a global network dedicated to improving the health of people who use drugs and initially was focused uh, primarily around hepatitis C, but now has expanded to include other infectious diseases and harms that can occur from any drug use. Who are INSU prisons? We are a prison-focused network and special interest group of INSU that was inaugurated in 2019. And our commitment is to advance scientific knowledge exchange, example, today's uh, virtual event, and advocacy for improving hepatitis C care in correctional settings worldwide. Next. So since its inception in 2019, INSU Prisons has been led by an executive committee chaired by Professor Andrew Lloyd in Sydney, Australia. The exec also consists of clinician researchers, uh, Dr. Matthew Akiyama from New York, Dr. Joaquin Cabezas from Spain, myself from Montreal, Canada, as well as um, an early career researcher, Yumi Sheehan, and recently, we uh, added two additional members to our executive committee, Julia Sheehan and, uh, from the UK and Nonso from Nigeria. Our goal as an executive is to drive the goals of the network. And this is primarily one to facilitate information exchange at the international level to enhance hepatitis C care in the custodial sector. Also to develop prison focused hep C education programs and there will be more on this in, in uh, upcoming years, which we then could adapt to diverse prison settings worldwide. And then thirdly to support advocacy and drive policy making to improve hepatitis C prevention and care efforts in prisons. Next slide. So how did this um, event emerge? Well, in 2020, many of us were on the front lines of the response to COVID-19, and we realized that we were unable to stay abreast of all that, that was published around hepatitis C in prisons. And so as an exec, we came together and created a bibliography um, that contains from A to Z all that was published um, around hepatitis C in correctional settings. Um, it became quite popular uh, and became actually an annual event whereby we produce this yearly bibliography. Following the bibliography, we, um, we rank um, articles of special interest and of outstanding interest. And then for the last two years, we've actually invited the authors, the first authors of the outstanding interest papers to discuss the research, some of the challenges of the research such uh, to the broader INSU Prisons uh, network. So this is our third uh, bibliography, uh, 2022, and our third virtual event highlighting some of what we believe is the best research um, to advance hepatitis C care in correctional settings. Next slide. I'll pass it to Julia. Thank you, Nadine. Um, sorry. So um, just some housekeeping um, before we begin, um, if you could please all keep your microphones muted until it's time for discussion, that would be great. Um, please feel free to post questions in the chat box at any time. And on the screen is an overview of today's programme. We will hear a series of presentations regarding outstanding papers from 2022. Lessons learned from these publications, implementation considerations, as well as the policy and practice implications. We will then engage in a panel discussion and a Q&A where presenters will be able to respond to all your questions about the real world implementation of their research. Next slide, please. So um, introducing 
our session facilitators. I'll start with Nadine Crompley, Assistant Professor at McGill University Health Centre, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, I'm Julia Sheehan, the National Women's Criminal Justice Manager at the Hepatitis C Trust in the UK. And behind the scenes today, we have Liv Dawson from INZU, who will be in the background making sure everything runs nice and smoothly. Next slide, please. Um, I'd now like to introduce our presenters. Um, we're very fortunate to have a large range of experts here today to provide us with an in-depth look at their groundbreaking research. And I'd like to thank them for giving up their time to be with us. I'm thrilled to introduce, sorry, next slide, please. I'm thrilled to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Jack Stone. Dr. Dr. Jack Stone is a research fellow in, in infectious disease mathematical modeling at the University of Bristol. His research focuses on the use of mathematical modeling to help us understand the transmission of different infectious diseases and impact and cost effectiveness of prevention and treatment measures. Specific expertise focuses on the transmission of HIV and HCV amongst people who inject drugs and other high-risk groups. One of his main re research interests is the impact of social structure, structural variables on drug use outcomes. Through undertaking systematic reviews, epidemiological analysis and infectious disease modeling, he has made major contributions to the advancement of, of knowledge, knowledge of how incarceration and homelessness can contribute significantly to health harms amongst people who inject drugs. And I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Stone. Thank you, Julia. And um, apologies for the very long bio. Um... No worry. <laughs> So can you can you see my slides? I think yes. Yeah. Thank you. So um, thank you for um, the invitation to present. It's it's a great honour to be able to present at the webinar today. I'm really looking forward to hearing the the other two presentations as well. So I'm going to be presenting uh, on some work uh, that I did looking at prison-based interventions in New South Wales, Australia. And this was a mathematical modeling study evaluating how important prison-based interventions are to achieving hepatitis C elimination among people who inject drugs. So it was published in 2022. This is why, why we're all here. Uh, it was published in uh, Liver International. And before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge all of my co-authors as well as the uh, funders for the study. So as way of background, I'm sure everybody on the call who's got an interest in prisons and hepatitis C will know a lot of this, but due to the criminalization of drug use, people inject drugs experience very high rates of incarceration. So uh, we've estimated that around 60% of those who inject drugs will have ever been incarcerated globally and with quite a wide range um, between settings. And this leads to a disproportionately high prevalence of hepatitis C in correctional settings. We know that a uh, history of incarceration is strongly associated with prevalent Jack, it seems we may have lost you for a moment. Are you back? You might be on mute, Jack. Can we hear you? Yeah, sorry. I've just come back in. I think it's the Wi-Fi in the hotel. Not uh, a problem. Shall I try again? We'll give it one more go and see how we go. <laughs> Whereabouts did I drop off at? Uh, quite early on, you were at uh, prevalent hep C infection. Prevalent hep C infection. Thank you. Um, so we know that a history of incarceration is strongly associated with prevalent infection, but uh, more recently we, we know that um, 
there are periods of increased risk either during incarceration or following release from prison. So a systematic review that uh, I conducted as part of my PhD showed that recent incarceration among people who inject drugs in the community, um, recent incarceration is associated with significant increases in the risk of acquiring hepatitis C uh, and also HIV as well with this being particularly high in Australia. So our global estimate was a 62% increase in Australia. This was 180% increased risk following prison release. So our modeling that um, uses this sort of data suggests that through these periods of increased risk, incarceration could be a very important driver of hepatitis C transmission amongst people who inject drugs. But also because there is that turnover between prison and the community, that prison-based interventions can have a significant impact on the overall uh, epidemic among people who inject drugs. So in New South Wales, um, similar to the sort of global estimates, over half of those who inject drugs have ever been incarcerated. In the community, there is high coverage of uh, harm reduction, so opioid agonist therapy and needle and syringe programs. And in prisons, uh, opioid agonist therapy has high coverage, which is comparable to the community, but there are no prison needle and syringe programs. So since the introduction of direct acting antivirals, so highly efficacious treatment for hepatitis C, there's been a significant scale up in treatment with um, there being recognition of both the importance of prisons as a as a sector for transmission of hepatitis C, but also as an opportunity for providing treatment scale up. And actually since 2010 in the, in the state, the number of treatments in prisons has increased from 80 to 1500 per year, with DA therapies when they were first introduced representing 6% uh, of treatments were in prison. By 2019, this had increased to 29. So almost a third of all DA therapies were being initiated in prisons. So we, we wanted to develop a model to assess how important incarceration is to ongoing transmission of hepatitis C, to evaluate the impact uh, in the past of prison-based interventions, and then looking forward how important prison-based interventions are for achieving the WHO elimination targets, of reducing incidence of hepatitis C by 80% by 2030. So I won't go into too much detail on the mathematical model, but we developed a dynamic compartmental model, which included incarceration, hepatitis C transmission and treatment among people who inject drugs in New South Wales, uh, and also opioid agonist therapy. So the model captures this increased risk of acquiring hepatitis C among those recently released from prison. And it also allows for differences in risk in prison compared to the community. It also allows for different coverages of opioid agonist therapy in prisons versus the community and different rates of hepatitis C treatment. Now, we use setting specific data, so data from New South Wales to both parameterize and calibrate this model. And we used a lot of data sources, but the main two were the Australian Needle and Syringe Program Survey, which is an annual cross-sectional serial behavioral survey conducted among people who inject drugs attending needle and syringe programs, as well as the STOP C study, which we'll hear more about later, uh, which assess the feasibility and effectiveness of hepatitis C treatment as prevention in prisons. And we calibrated the model using Bayesian methods to data on incarceration dynamics, prevalence of hepatitis C, data on treatment, and also upward agonist therapy coverage, and basically the Bayesian methods allow us to capture uncertainty in the data used to input into the model and calibrate the model and propagate that uncertainty through to model projections. Okay, so what did we find? So in 2020, the model estimates that 7% of people who inject drugs are currently incarcerated with those in prison having between 0.6 and 1.9 times the risk of transmission as people inject drugs in the community. Those recently released have much higher risk than those in the community not uh, recently released from prison. So between 2.6 and 3.8 times higher. So 
what these two periods of um, differences in risk, either in prison or following re release, if we could remove these differences, we could avert roughly a quarter of all new hepatitis C infections among people who inject drugs over the next 10 years. Another way of putting that is, these differences in risk due to incarceration are contributing a quarter of all new infections over the next 10 years. When we look back at the impact that, in, that prison-based interventions have had to date, we find that in 2019, prison-based uh, OAT and hepatitis C treatment averted about a sixth of all new hepatitis C infections. With these um, interventions, if these interventions hadn't been in place in, over the last 10 years, so between 2010 and 2020, the incidence of hepatitis C would have been 30% higher. So they have reduced incidence by roughly a quarter. Uh, with prison-based hepatitis C treatments being um, the most important of the two interventions, having roughly a five times greater impact than OAT. Looking forward, so this figure shows um, a lot, lots of things. So the, um, the box and whiskers show the date that 80% uh, reduction in 80% in hepatitis C incidence would occur uh, for different modeled scenarios with the, the numbers labeled next to each box and whisker, showing the proportion of runs, model runs, or the probability that hepatitis C elimination would be achieved by 2030. So if we start off with our status quo, so that is community treatment rates are staying the same and prison-based interventions continue as they are. There's a 99% chance that elimination will occur before 2030. So New South Wales are, are on track. We then look at removing prison-based interventions. We see that if we remove both OAT and hepatitis C treatment, this probability drops down to 10%. So with prison interventions, 99% without 10%. So prison-based interventions, interventions are crucial for achieving elimination by 2030. And in particular, hepatitis C treatment, without which the uh, probability would be 18%. We also look at what would happen if we did more in prisons. So what if we introduced needle and syringe programs at 50% coverage or 100% coverage, or if we scaled up prison-based hepatitis C treatment with DAAs. Now this does improve the probability of achieving elimination, and it means that elimination would occur a bit earlier than without these interventions, but because as things stand, there's such a high likelihood of achieving elimination by 2030, introducing these interventions doesn't appear to be having uh, much effect on the likelihood of achieving elimination. But then we looked to see what would happen if treatment rates reduced in the community by a quarter. Now we find uh, the probability of achieving elimination is only 85%. And then without prison-based interventions, this goes down to 0.1. So it's not, wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen if community treatment rates uh, reduced by a quarter and we removed all prison-based interventions. And in this scenario, prison-based OAT is, has more importance than it does before. So it's picking up some of the slack from the reduced uh, treatment going on in the community. Similarly, improving um, prison-based interventions, so either providing needle and syringe programs or scaling up prison-based hepatitis C treatment, now has quite a uh, potential to have an impact on the likelihood of achieving elimination. So providing needle and syringe programs at 50% coverage increases the probability by 4%, 100% coverage increases it by uh, around 6%. Okay, so to summarise, we found that incarceration is currently contributing around a quarter of new hepatitis C infections among people who inject drugs in New South Wales uh, over the next 10 years. We found that prison-based interventions have mitigated some of this uh, increase in risk associated with incarceration, with around a sixth of infections each year being averted just through prison-based interventions. 
Over the next 10 years, prison-based interventions will be critical for achieving elimination among people who inject drugs. So without these, uh, the probability of achieving elimination drops from 99% down to 10%. Scaling up uh, interventions such as hepatitis C treatment or introducing needle and syringe programs in, in prison could be important for achieving elimination if community treatment rates decline and arguably could be important uh, as a sort of um, just in case of just in case could could um, shore up that probability uh, of achieving elimination. So, so what are the implications? So this is um, modeling for New South Wales. We did calibrate the model to very setting specific data. However, because this is a setting with such a such a high level of community based interventions, and we still find that prison based interventions are critical for achieving elimination targets, I think we can say that hepatitis C elimination plans have got to incorporate interventions within prisons. Uh, otherwise, elimination, I don't think, uh, will be possible. Following on from that, we know that most countries have quite low opioid agonist therapy coverage in prisons, or it's unavailable altogether. Whilst most national hepatitis C elimination plans do not include interventions for prisoners either, which possibly, I think, suggests that there's a low probability that we're going to achieve hepatitis C elimination unless we start to uh, introduce prison based interventions and soon. Uh, so thank you. That's, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. Thank you so much, Jack. We really appreciate you coming today. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Tim Papaluka, who is a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. He completed a PhD at the University of Melbourne in 2020 in hepatitis C infection. This included a number of research studies evaluating the efficacy of prison-based hepatitis C management, strategies to, st to streamline prison-based hepatitis C care and transition healthcare interventions for individuals returning to the community from the prison setting. Thanks very much for that introduction, Julian. Thanks again to um, the INSU uh, Prisons Group for this opportunity to present uh, my research today. It's um, very exciting to be here. I'd, I'd firstly just like to um, note all my uh, co-authors on here. This was very much a, a group um, effort with a lot of work from our pharmacy team, our nursing team, um, and all of our uh, researchers at St. Vincent's and, and Burnett as well. Um, all right, I won't spend too much time going in the background. I'm sure this audience is quite well versed. We know that it's a priority to eliminate hepatitis C at a global level, and there's elimination targets around this, and really uh, continual efforts to engage individuals um, living with hepatitis C is important to achieve these targets. And we've previously demonstrate, demonstrated that um, the prison is, is one such place that we can engage individuals living with hepatitis C and to commence them on treatment. Um, we have a, um, a statewide hepatitis service that operates in our state of Victoria in Australia that services all of our prisons. Um, this is a nurse-led model of care um, with our nurses visiting each of these uh, prison settings, undertaking face-to-face -face assessments, uh, performing uh, fibrous scan where indicated and in initiating individuals on hepatitis C treatment. We evaluated um, the outcome of this program, the safety and its efficacy in uh, two uh, 2019. And we demonstrated that hepatitis C care in the prison setting was very safe and effective and uh, SVR rates were in excess of 95%. There are, however, a number of individuals who are released untreated from the prison sector. And this is usually due to time constraints in their prison sentence. We know that that period of returning to the community is an extremely challenging one as someone in, uh, re enters the community from the prison setting. Um, they're met with a number of immediate competing priorities. 
including trying to find gainful employment or an income stream, uh, trying to find stable accommodation, and also renegotiating social networks, which can be quite challenging uh, in certain circumstances. We know as well for individuals who are injecting prior to incarceration that there are um, high rates of returning to injecting drug use. And this is associated with really quite high morbidity mortality in this time frame. And so it was important for us to try and work out in the context of these pretty significant um, priorities, how did hepatitis C uh, treatment fit for individuals who hadn't been treated whilst incarcerated? And so we initially looked at this retrospectively and we audited um, the outcomes of 75 individuals who underwent comprehensive hepatitis C assessment whilst incarcerated. Um, but unfortunately, we were released untreated due to um, time constraints on their sentence duration. Of these 75 individuals, they all received a um, comprehensive uh, discharge summary to the nominated GP, which included blood-based investigation results, fibrous scan results, and information on DAA prescribing. We then audited our um, national record to see who had been commenced on treatment within six months following community re-entry. And we saw that only 19 of those 75 had started uh, DAA therapy, or had been prescribed DAA therapy. When we looked a bit closely at this group, we actually saw that a significant minority, around seven of the 19, actually commenced in the context of reincarceration uh, with subsequent treatment by our, our nurses in the prison setting. So what this indicated to us is, um, despite these efforts, we were not really achieving the level of treatment for those released untreated that we would desire. Despite this, there is actually a range of data showing that transitional interventions can significantly improve continuity during uh, continuity of healthcare during this very uh, difficult uh, transition. Um, there's data regarding increased uh, continuation of HIV antiviral therapy, um, participation with mental health and drug services, and reduced emergency department presentations as well. And this is through a range of things such as transitional clinics, um, care navigation, um, peer navigation, transportation assistance. But at the time that we started this study, there was limited data regarding the effectiveness of transitional care uh, for hepatitis C specifically. And so the aim of this study was to determine if transitional care using a care navigator model for individuals living with hepatitis C infection following release from prison was associated with an increase of DAA initiation within six months of community re-entry. The way that we conducted this study was that it was a prospective randomised control trial and we uh, initiated recruitment in November of 2018 uh, with final recruitment in March of 2020. Individuals were eligible to be included in the study um, if they had a hepatitis C infection, if they had an anticipated release from the prison within four weeks of their initial assessment with one of um, the statewide hepatitis clinical nurse consultants, and were able to provide at least one point of contact that we could reach them on following community re-entry. We excluded individuals who had cirrhosis and also those who had commenced hepatitis C treatment within the prison setting. This next slide um, talks about uh, the model of care and also how we conducted the study. I'll take you through it uh, slowly. So in the green bar here, uh, that is our, um, uh, the contact we had with our participants in the, in the prison setting. So during prison-based assessments with one of our clinical nurse consultants, uh, the nature and aims of the study were described, and then they consented to provide us with contact details for themselves or um, trusted peers or family members. They provided consent to release their pharmaceutical benefit scheme data so that we could determine who had been um, prescribed treatment at six months following release. And importantly, all the participants were provided with a toll-free number and encouraged to contact the care navigator on release to discuss initiating hepatitis C treatment. Once they were released um, to the community, we randomised individuals on a one-to-one -one basis to either care navigation or standard of care. For individuals who were randomised to care navigation, we made attempts to contact them in the first six weeks to confirm their community contact details, to consent to ongoing care navigation and to make plans to initiate treatment. We followed these individuals through to the SBR 12 time point. What the model included was DAA medications. These were prescribed at St Vincent's Hospital and um, dispensed, and they were either created for a local pharmacy for collection or sent to the individual's home address or could be collected in person. We also provided telephone-based support, um, which could be initiated by the care navigator or by the participant. And uh, opioid agonist therapy was re, uh, reimbursed for the duration of their DAA therapy. 
Um, it's the standard practice of the Department of Justice and uh, Community Safety in Victoria is that this is usually for four weeks following community reentry. So we continued this for an additional four or eight weeks, depending on whether they were prescribed, uh, which DA medication they were prescribed. We also um, provided supermarket vouchers at baseline at uh, end of treatment and SVI 12 time points for, uh, for a participation reimbursement. And we uh, monitored for reincarceration with pathways for streamlined DAA initiation in the event of a reincarceration episode. Conversely, individuals in the standard of care, um, which is in the orange down the bottom here, were not contacted immediately. Uh, a comprehensive hepatitis C discharge summary was uh, sent to their nominated general practitioner, again, including blood-based information and information on DAA prescribing for uh, general practitioners. We only then contacted these individuals at six months following community re-entry uh, to confirm if they had commenced hepatitis C treatment in the community, and if not, this was confirmed via uh, PBS records. And for individuals who remained untreated, they were offered crossover to care navigation as in keeping with the blue box here. We were looking specifically at the number of participants who were prescribed hepatitis C DAA therapy within six months of release. And other aspects we wanted to address was time to hepatitis C DAA prescription, how many were treated in the community and how many participants were treated in the prison setting. These, uh, this slide shows the, the data or the baseline characteristics of our cohort. In total, we had 46 participants. Uh, the median age was 36 and around 60% were male. One in five was Indigenous Australian, and one individual had an HIV co-infection. Individuals either had no fibrosis or mild or moderate fibrosis, but there was no cirrhosis. Uh, and all individuals had a history of injecting drug use, which was recent for around 90%. There were high rates of self-reported psychiatric uh, comorbidities, uh, which was 50%, with around 43% being on psychotropic medication. Around a quarter were prescribed opiate agonist therapy at time of discharge. And we saw high rates of reincarceration over the period of evaluation of 43. The groups were quite matched between care navigation and standard of care, with the exception being higher rates of self-reported um, psychiatric illness in the care navigation group. Now, this was our key finding um, from the study. So we demonstrated that care navigation was associated with a much higher likelihood of being prescribed DAA therapy with 73% of people receiving care navigation compared to 33% of those receiving standard of care. We also demonstrated that the time to DAA prescription was significantly shorter uh, for the care navigation group with a median of 21 days following community re-entry compared to 82 days for those receiving standard of care. And certainly, um, you know, highlighting a point that Jack raised in his talk, we know that there is a degree of incident infection. So this probably does have important uh, implications as well. Uh, we also saw higher rates of community-based DAA treatment uh, in the care navigation group compared to standard of care. And when we excluded those individuals who had already been commenced on hepatitis C treatment uh, before they re-entered the uh, prison se sector, we saw comparable rates of prison-based hepatitis C treatment. I thought I'd take you through um, uh, the care navigation uh, group in a, just a few brief slides. It became clear that actually successful, uh, being able to successfully contact an individual following community re-entry was key. So of those 22 individuals, around 15 or 15 of those participants would, were contactable, of which 13 individuals could be commenced on hepatitis C treatment within the community. A further one individual um, had... Uh, was contactable, but unfortunately was reincarcerated prior to receipt of their DAA medication, and one individual was not able to be supported to treatment. Of those individuals who were not contactable, only one uh, commenced treatment of their own accord in the community. Um, one individual was reincarcerated and treated, and five did not start treatment. And so really this showed us the importance that successful uh, contact was really critical for engagement in, in transitional care. Um, so if we were able to contact people, there was a 90, 93% of those individuals who were commenced on treatment compared to only 28% of individuals who were uncontactable. And this was the only factor that really predicted a likelihood of starting treatment, whilst gender, age, opioid agonist therapy and other factors didn't predict this. Um, looking a bit more closely at contact, we saw that it took an average of four attempts to uh, reach the uh, participant directly. And interestingly, whilst a, a personal mobile number was the most common form of uh, 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 personal number was the most common form of contact that was listed by participants, 
In actual fact, initial successful contact was more commonly mediated through a parent or other family member really talking about the importance of these social networks and community re-entry. Looking briefly at the standard of care arm, uh, in total 24 individuals were in this group um, of whom eight access treatment. This included five individuals who were treated in the community and three in the prison following a reincarceration episode. 16 individuals did not access treatment. Of these 16, three were contactable at, at the six month uh, point and we were able to start two of these individuals on hepatitis C treatment via the care navigation pathway. It was another point about contact um, to be made, I guess we were able to contact 65% of individuals upfront compared to only 30% at the six month mark. And I think this talks to um, the differences between perceived and actual um, living circumstances, social networks uh, following community re-entry and really highlights the importance that if we do uh, try and continue these uh, efforts that it really contact needs to be upfront and assertive. Importantly, only one individual out of uh, the group of 46 uh, contacted us via the toll-free number. So again, I think assertive follow-up initiated by a care navigator or a similar uh, is important to, to get uh, adequate uh, outcomes for REIT to justify resourcing. Um, so in conclusion, hepatitis C transitional care using our care navigator model was associated with an increased likelihood of DAA initiation and also a significantly reduced time to DAA prescription. And we found that contact was really key for um, engagement for transitional care uh, with a very high rate of individuals who were contactable commenced on treatment. This data has contributed to the implementation of a care navigator led hepatitis C treatment for individuals released untreated from the Victorian prison system, which was uh, funded by the Department of Health um, for a period of a year following this study and, and continues uh, through hard works of our uh, statewide hepatitis nurses and our integrated hepatitis nurses around Victoria and is also contributing to new models of care um, for individuals um, being developed for those with community correction orders. Again, I'd like to thank all of my uh, collaborators on this research uh, and particularly my um, primary supervisor, uh, Professor Thompson. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that, Tim. Um, really interesting. Our next speaker is Joanne Carson, um, who is currently undertaking a PhD in Melbourne through the Kirby Institute and at the Centre for Big Data Research in Health. Joanne is interested in applying novel statistical methods, including machine learning, to analyse health data with a specific focus on infectious disease. Hi everyone and, and thank you for uh, that introduction. It's, it's a real honour to get to speak here today. So I'm calling in from Gadigal country uh, in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to elders of this land uh, past and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are attending today. Uh, just as a bit of background, and again, I won't go into too much detail, uh, but in Australia, uh, DAA therapy for HCV is constituting an increasing proportion of our national treatment uptake. So it's risen from 6% in 2016 to almost 40% in 2020. So incarceration can provide an opportunity to test and treat HCV among individuals that may not engage with health services in the community. Uh, but those with ongoing injecting drug use may have a high risk of reinfection. Uh, so in Australia, people do have access to opioid agonist treatment in prison, but there is no access to needle and syringe programs in any Australian prison. So data for this analysis came from the surveillance and treatment of people in prison with hepatitis C or stop C study. And this was a prospective study which ran from 2014 to 2019 with DAA scale up from 2017. So it included 24 prison sites, two maximum security mail facilities that were in regional New South Wales, and two medium security facilities uh, that were in the Sydney region. So in total, 388 participants received treatment. Follow-up visits post-treatment occurred every three to six months while the person was incarcerated. And these visits included an assessment of HCV reinfection and the completion of drug use behavioral questionnaires. So the aims of this talk today are number one, to assess HCV reinfection incidents in Australian prisons, two, to assess the factors associated with reinfection risk, 
And three, this is something new that, that isn't in the paper that I've just been working on recently, uh, to use behavioral modeling to assess the impact of treatment on drug use behaviors over time. And then finally, to assess reinfection, retreatment, uptake and outcomes. So looking at our study population, of those 388 that received treatment, 161 had sufficient follow-up data to be included in this analysis. So this includes an ETR or SVR and at least one post-treatment follow-up visit after that that monitored for reinfection. So we want to compare these groups to make sure we've got a relatively representative sample of people. Uh, there were some differences between the groups, and I'll just highlight those now. Uh, first of all, the median prison stay was longer, although that's unsurprising. Uh, rates of previous incarceration were a bit lower in those with follow-up available. Uh, OAT with, among those reporting injecting drug use in prison was higher and injecting drug use in the last month um, was slightly lower in our group with follow-up available. Now, among those people who did report injecting drug use in the last month, uh, daily injecting or more was similar. Uh, receptive sharing of needles or syringes was very high, 90 or 89%, but similar. Uh, we did have a little bit higher rates of methamphetamine use in our group with follow-up available, but um, overall, uh, methadone or buprenorphine were the predominant drugs being injected in this population. So these groups are relatively similar. There may be a slightly lower risk profile uh, for those that we did have follow-up available for though. So looking now at a cumulative hazard graph of time to reinfection and just a very simplistic interpretation of this, by the one year mark, we're looking at about a quarter of our treated population being reinfected. So of those 161 interval, uh, individuals, we uh, recorded 18 cases of reinfection and that gave us a reinfection incidence of 12.5 per 100 person years. If we stratify now by different characteristics of the population, uh, so first injecting drug use with sharing of needles and syringes. So those reporting no injecting drug use in the last month had a reinfection incidence of 4.6 per 100 person years. I do wanna note though, that these behavioral questionnaires asked about drug use behaviors in the last month. Um, and the, the study visits were typically at least three months apart. So we're potentially not capturing the full spectrum of behavior uh, between study visits, although this was done to reduce uh, recall bias. Uh, next in the dashed line there, we've got injecting drug use among those reporting no needle and syringe sharing. And we had a reinfection incidence of 13.3 here. But the majority of this group, although they weren't sharing needles and syringes, did report sharing ancillary injecting equipment. Finally, onto our, our pink line here, which is uh, individuals who reported injecting drug use in the last month with needle and syringe sharing. We're seeing some very steep increases in the probability of reinfection over time. And by about the one year mark, we're looking at 35, 40% of the population becoming reinfected. And that's giving us an extremely high reinfection incidence rate of 28.7 per 100 person years. Uh, finally, um, Looking, we're comparing the groups here that were incarcerated for the duration of follow-up and those that were released and reincarcerated during follow-up. So 41% of our population were released and reincarcerated during follow-up. And I think this really gives you some insight just as to how dynamic this prison population is. Um, there were a few issues um, with measuring incidents among those released and reincarcerated, and I will get onto that in the next slide. But as you can see here, the, these two curves that we've got for the probability of reinfection look very similar, and we didn't find any significant difference between them. So 13.6 for those continu uh, in incarcerated continuously during follow-up, and 11.3 for those released and reincarcerated during follow-up. So now uh, looking at the factors associated with reinfection, um, and I've just snatched this from the paper, apologies if it's a bit hard to read. Um, there were two factors that came up as significant. So the first was injecting drugs in the last month with needle and syringe sharing, uh, increasing risk fivefold. Then the next was HCV testing interval. So the longer the interval between testing, the lower the likelihood of reinfection detection. Apologies, going the wrong way. 
Um, so what happens when we have these long intervals between testing, and this is what happened with some of those individuals that were released and reincarcerated, is that reinfections can go undetected for extended periods, and then our sort of estimates of when reinfection occurred become less certain. So, I mean, this combined with a slightly higher risk profile among those, um, slightly lower, sorry, risk profile among those with follow-up available has likely led to underestimations of reinfection um, in this analysis. Uh, another thing that can happen if there is a long period um, between uh, reinfection surveillance, uh, transient infections uh, can go um, undetected. And so by and large, if, if someone spontaneously clears, this is not so much an issue for the individual, but in a high risk setting like prison, this could potentially have an impact on HCV transmission. And, oops. Okay, uh, now looking at drug use behaviours in the population. Uh, so here what I'm doing is looking at trajectories of behaviour before, during and after treatment in prison. And to do this, I'm using a model called group-based trajectory modelling. Um, and this is used to identify relatively homogenous clusters of behaviour over time. So this first one here, uh, we've got injecting drug use um, in the last month, and we have 37% of the population assigned to the low probability trajectory and 32% assigned to the high probability trajectory. And we're not seeing any changes in those groups, but there is this group in the blue here that had decreasing probability of injecting drug use over time. So screening there is our pre-treatment visit. Baseline is when treatment commenced. ETR is that end of treatment. SVR12 is a confirmation of cure testing. And then I've got three, three monthly follow-up visits after that. Looking at um, opioid injecting, we're seeing some very similar patterns, and this is unsurprising um, given that most of the population were injecting opioids, so either methadone or buprenorphine in a very small amount of heroin. Uh, next, we're seeing some indication as to why this might be happening. Uh, so this is looking at receiving opioid probability, sorry, of receiving opioid agonist therapy over time. And so we have a small group, 24, a relatively small group quarter um, with a high probability of receiving opioid agonist treatment over time. 66% had a low probability of receiving opioid agonist treatment. And then we had a small group um, that had increasing probability of receiving opioid agonist treatment. And you can see here the, the confidence intervals are extremely wide. Um, and this is because I'm using a relatively small population. And it's also an artifact of using logic models in, in group-based trajectory modeling, uh, but it is actually statistically significant. Finally, uh, among our treated population that reported injecting drug use, looking at needle and syringe sharing, and so we've got 62% to uh, assigned to the high probability trajectory and that, that remains stable over time. And then we've got 38% assigned to the decreasing probability trajectory. Uh, finally, looking at uh, retreatment uptake and outcomes. So of those 18 cases of reinfection, 11 were retreated, one had spontaneous clearance and six were not retreated by the last study visit. Here I'm looking at the estimated date of reinfection to retreatment. And what I'm trying to estimate here is, is the amount of time a person was viremic uh, with reinfection. So we've got a median of 150 days with a range of 81 to 327 days. So that, that's almost a year that a person uh, remained viremic after reinfection. When we look at the time um, from reinfection detection to retreatment, it does come down. So we've got a median of 55 days, but a range of 22 days up to 239 days, which is almost eight months. And this is still a relatively long time period for someone to remain viremic after reinfection has been um, detected. So this is where rapid test and treat programs in prisons can really come into play. So these point of care tests that can give you a HCV RNA result within one hour can facilitate the initiation of retreatment on the same day. And as they're just a finger stick rather than a venous sample, uh, they can also facilitate increased frequency of surveillance to detect reinfections and to get people onto treatment. And this can be used um, potentially to reduce transmission in prison. 
Looking at retreatment outcomes, um, so seven out of seven individuals had a known retreatment outcome and seven out of seven achieved cure. And we know from some larger samples looking at retreatment for reinfection that it is highly effective. There really is no reason not to retreat someone, assuming the individual is happy to move forward with the retreatment. Uh, we also look at the ITT SVR, and what this does is include individuals with an unknown uh, treatment outcome as failures. And it goes down to 63% here, and this is because individuals uh, were being released prior to getting their SVR 12 test. So this isn't really an issue if the, if the person has had the opportunity to complete their full course of treatment, but if they're released during their treatment course and their medication doesn't go with them, then that, that is a problem. So we really do need to make sure that if someone is released from prison, their full prescription goes with them so they have the opportunity to complete treatment. In conclusion, uh, there was an excessive rate of post-treatment reinfection in prisons, and this may reduce the benefits of treatment expansion in this setting. So risk of reinfection is strongly associated with needle and syringe sharing among people uh, who recently injected drugs. So these findings, um, sort of somewhat contrary to Jack's, um, do support increased access to harm reduction in prison and including needle and syringe programs. And I think apart from preventing HCV transmission, these can also have a, you know, effect on sort of soft tissue infections and other injecting relating harms. So I do think it's important to push forward with needle and syringe programs in prisons in Australia um, and increased coverage of opioid agonist treatment. Uh, strategies that facilitate increased frequency of reinfection surveillance and the rapid initiation of retreatment may be used as tools to, to reduce transmission. And then, of course, taking a step back and having a big picture look, I, I think one of the best things we could do is stop incarcerating people for drug crimes. So I, I don't believe drug use is a consideration for the justice system. It's something that can be much better handled in a health environment. And I think the decriminalisation of drugs is really needed to improve the health and quality of life for all people who use drugs. Uh, finally, for my acknowledgements, uh, first and foremostly, the study participants whose contribution to our research has been absolutely invaluable. Um, it, it wouldn't happen without them. So thank you um, to all study participants. Um, my PhD supervisors, Greg, Bazard, Gail and Sebastiano, uh, the STOPSI Protocol Steering Committee, and in particular, I'd like to call out um, Greg Dorr and Andrew Lloyd, who are the study PIs, uh, the study coordinators, who are the prison nurses that were on the ground making sure the study was running and getting people onto treatment. STOPC was a partnership between all these organizations you can see on your screen. So we had uh, university research institutes, pharmaceutical company, community organizations, and uh, New South Wales Health. And I'd like to thank all anyone involved in the study from all of these groups for being involved. Uh, the STOPC paper is published in Clinical Infectious Diseases, and you can download it using that link. Uh, it is an open access, so if you do have any issues um, getting a copy of the paper, just email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy. I also have a QR code for it on the next slide. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for your attention, and I will do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Just before I hand over to Nadine, I just really wanted to thank Tim, Jack, Joanne. That was amazing. Super interesting and definitely shining the a light on the way to go forward so that we can get um, elimination. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. And thanks to the three of you. Really, there's a lot of material to digest, and I'm sure we can sit in and hash out each of these papers individually for the next 30 minutes, but that's really all the time we have for the Q&A. We will take questions um, in two fashions. One, uh, if you feel comfortable raising your hand and uh, vocalizing your question, you may do so in that manner or you may write your question in the chat box and we will field them in that way. So to start off, I saw a question from Andrew Lloyd. Um, Andrew, do you, wanna, do you want to articulate it or shall I? No, no, happy to, uh, Nadine. Thanks so much. It, it was a question for you, Tim, just about the resources required to successfully care navigate. It sounds like it's moderately labor intensive, you know, so I'm wondering about how it can operate at scale. 
Yeah, thanks for the question, Andrew. Uh, I guess the, the components are broken down into a few, I guess. There was the Care Navigator. This was part of my PhD, and so I, I, I was the Care Navigator for the purpose of this study. Um, and then there's, I guess, nursing resources within the prison sector uh, and also pharmacy resources. So I think in regards to those, those latter two, um, those uh, from a nursing uh, time frame, uh, these were individuals who were referred for prison-based assessment. I don't think that there was, uh, uh, you know, much increased time expenditure um, beyond the, con the consenting process in gathering contact information. Uh, and from pharmacy, uh, we we're fortunate that pharmacy at St Vincent's is extremely supportive of um, supporting individuals who are um, have more difficulty accessing hepatitis C care. And so uh, we do a lot of treatments in the community um, for marginalised populations in the safe injecting room space. And so um, they had capacity to increase this as well. I guess from the Care Navigator perspective, we only we had 22 individuals in this arm, and that was over a, a relatively long period of time. I think my there, there's certainly um, a few hours spent per person at the initial um, contact phase, uh, ensuring that we have adequate uh, information to prescribe DA therapy and arranging for the medication to be sent out for that individual. But once medication was received, um, the the follow up requirements dropped off significantly. So. I think I probably would have been uh, probably contributing about a 0.2 equivalent EFT in terms of the management of this. Um, so I think that, you know, in, in the setting of having a, a sort of a, a well-resourced um, uh, prison uh, hepatitis C treatment program and a supportive pharmacy, um, the care navigation itself was not too significant uh, in regards of time expenditure. Good on you, thanks. Tim, and just piggybacking on that question, I'm curious, are you planning to do any cost effectiveness analyses to look at this specific, to answer this question specifically? And I'm curious about your choice of terms. You use the term care navigation. And um, in my mind, navigation requires a peer, a patient, uh, hand-holding to some degree, not necessarily a telephone consultation. So I'm curious, um, I'm curious where, why you chose the term care navigation. And if you had to do it again, would you use a similar term? And do you think it's a fair description of, of what your, act, your intervention actually did? Yeah, thanks for the question, Nadine. Um, so in, in terms of your first question, at this point in time, a, a cost analysis um, uh, isn't, isn't planned for this particular study, but it's something that we could uh, potentially discuss. In regards to care navigation, um, yeah, I, I, I agree and I take your point. I think it probably doesn't necessarily um, uh, address what the intervention delivered in this case. I think probably what we what we offered was a transitional program to support individuals to hepatitis C that was very much, um, unfortunately in this case, not uh, uh, peer-led or um, nursing-led. Um, I in, in terms of what I would term it now, I'm not sure, but I, I probably agree with you that care navigation is probably not the most appropriate term. Um, you know, in, importantly, uh, this, this work was um, funded by the Department of uh, Health um, for, a, for a period of a year following the completion of this study and um, the care navigator role for, to, to sort of find that term again was, was uh, from a nursing staff and, um, and that also worked extremely well in this capacity. And my impression is that um, that it would work well uh, led by a, a peer navigator as well. But um, yeah, I, I take your point. I think that the terminology probably doesn't truly really reflect the, um, the intervention. That's fair. And just staying on with you, um, you know, this is an area of research that, I, that I'm involved in. Um, and I'm curious, do you think we've answered uh, the question as to the most effective model of care to improve linkage to care? Or do you think there are still questions? Do you think there's a model that, that may supersede your current model? And if so, what would you propose, you know, if you were redesigning this study with what you now know, um, how would your intervention change? Yeah, so I mean, the with our intervention there's a range of um, different components and it's it's difficult to know exactly which one was the effective one my my sense um myself is that what was effective was uh, someone 
taking interest in actually engaging these individuals in care and making an effort to engage them in care. And I think actually there was a great desire for all of our participants to be treated. Um, but, but that challenging time means that um, hepatitis C treatment isn't the first priority appropriately, I think. Um, and so I think that actually, if we strip back this model to have someone contacting people assertively, uh, sending out medications and supporting them to start treatment, that that probably would be enough um, to, uh, uh, to, for the majority of people to get them on treatment. But of course, I haven't got the data to prove that because the, the model was um, multifaceted. The, the second thing, I guess, is that, that, that I guess our paradigm has changed in terms of hepatitis treatment in the prison, where historically, you know, when we started this study, we were including individuals who had four weeks or less uh, in incarceration. But this is very much a population now that is started on hepatitis C treat in the prison. We know that the best chance of starting an individual on prison is to start, uh, sorry, on hepatitis C treatment is to start them whilst they're incarcerated and to provide all their medications on release. And so certainly now our um, clinical nurse consultants are um, a lot more aggressive at starting individuals with one week of incarceration and making sure they're going with their medication. Um, and I think that, 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 that future models really um, should be more about um, sending individuals with treatment and then ensuring um, linkage to care uh, so certainly, you know, the, the model that our uh, a lot of our clinical nurse consultants using now is we do have a, a network of integrated hepatitis nurse specialists that cover Victoria. And so the model really now is about ensuring individuals are leaving with medications and then linking them in with the uh, integrated hepatitis nurse um, to uh, follow up to ensure that treatment is, um, is available that hasn't been lost during that transition period um, and helping individuals restart where that medication has been replaced. And I think that's probably a more pragmatic approach. But I think that this still does have a role um, for individuals that are released untreated. But I think that the model could be stripped back, um, you know, in its complexity. Super. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, any questions from our audience before we continue the rapid fire? <laughs> I have a question if nobody in the it. audience has answered quickly. Um, for Tim, um, how did you choose the amount of reimbursement? Because it was quite high, highly reimbursed. How did you choose that? Um, was it informed by the community? And how can you justify incremental increases based on progression along the cascade of care? Yeah, thanks. And where would the money come from in the real world? Yeah. Uh, so thanks very much for the question, uh, Julia. So we were, this was, I guess, performed in the context of a, a, a clinical trial, and we fortunately had um, had had funding to be able to provide that. Essentially, the, the, the reimbursements were reimbursements for participant time, and they were to reflect um, the participant time. Uh, so essentially... Uh, we spent some time on the phone initially uh, with individuals and then at the end of at, at, at treatment inception and then at end of treatment and SVR 12 time points, um, we, we, the plan was to undertake quite comprehensive um, uh, clinical uh, uh, surveys, I guess, focusing on um, a lot of social and uh, psychological and lifestyle data for these individuals. Um, and at the SVR 12 time point as well, the addition of a blood test. And so those, those um, vouchers were built in um, to reflect um, reimbursement for participant time, essentially. Um, it became, it became uh, obvious quite early in the study that undertaking sort of in-depth half an hour to an hour uh, questionnaires over the telephone was extremely challenging. Um, and also um, there was a lot of sensitive material that was discussed. And so we would try to schedule times to undertake these, but invariably um, it was difficult to contact um, participants at, at specific times and, and contact was more ad hoc. Um, so essentially we continued with the reimbursements as planned uh, for the study. My, as I was saying, my impression is that they were, um, you know, had a minimal impact in the actual likelihood of individuals starting treatment. Um, certainly, you know, if we all individuals received uh, a $20 voucher at um, commencement of treatment, 
around 50% had, um, you know, we were still able to contact at end of treatment and they received a voucher and then very few um, undertook the SBR 12 time point. And I think if we were redesigning this study, I think it was important to include there to reflect reimbursement for participant time at end of treatment and SBR 12. But I think in terms of a, a model moving forward in the future, um, I don't think it would be critical, um, uh, you know, at all to include this. There is some data, you know, looking at incentives more broadly. I mean, I, this was sort of um, for compensation for time, but incentives more broadly in the hepatitis C and hepatitis B world, which has shown that, uh, you know, incentivization is helpful, but I guess that's sort of a, a discussion for um, beyond this study. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. And um, there's a question in the chat uh, for Joanne. Looks like your study included medium and maximum security prisons. Wondering if you can shed light on how the treatment challenges may be different, if at all, between prisons of different security levels uh, and any other thoughts you may have from your own personal experience. Thanks. Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually not a clinician, so I'm just a PhD student um, and I've been analyzing data, but we are incredibly fortunate to have Andrew Lloyd on the call, who was the treating clinician for most of these people. So I think he can, I can tell you what I've heard secondhand, but I think he can probably give you the best insight um, as to what the differences are between these two settings. So that's it, Joanne, you just dogged me in, is that the truth? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So as a broad statement, maximum security, it's all about access. From the point of view of hepatitis care, it's all about access. You know, at what proportion of the day or the week or at any individual time can you gain access to undertake the testing or the follow-up evaluation or initiation of treatment? And it's somewhat more difficult in maximum security. But, but uh, neither security classification is uh, unduly challenging. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we'll stay with Joanne for now. Uh, please feel free to raise your hands or um, any, insert any questions in the chat. Don't be shy. Nothing, no question is silly or dumb. We're a very friendly bunch. Um, Joanne, there's you know great debate about how often we should be screening people who inject drugs in the community in prison, the feasibility of even doing it in prison on a pseudo regular basis, Q3 to six months. Um, I'm curious how your median time to reinfection, give you know despite the caveat of how that was measured, of uh, 223 days, so just over six months. How can that? Um, be used to inform surveillance practices as well as uh, prison-based policies post hepatitis C treatment in prison with respect to uh, screening uh, strategies. Yeah, thank you, Nadine. That that's a really really great question. Um, so I think the the median time to reinfection was just over two hundred days. Um, but it was different between those that were cast, incarcerated continuously and, and those that were released and reincarcerated. So it was around 180 days for those continuously incarcerated. Um, and then it jumped to about 300 among those released and reincarcerated. And that's that's due to those issues that while they're in the community, um, they weren't able to be tested. And for some of these people, it, they may have been back within a week in prison, but for others, it, it, it could be up to a year. So it did make it difficult you know, not only to estimate um, the time point that reinfection occurred, but but where it occurred as well. So it could have, you know, occurred in prison before they were released, while they're in the community, or when they came back to prison before they got the HCBRNA testing. Um, but in terms of guiding policy, we did work out incidents as well um, for the different periods, and the three to six monthly period was the period that had the highest reinfection incidence um, compared to less than three months or greater than um, six months. So it was 19.3 per 100 person years. But to be honest, what I think this reflects is people who have higher injecting frequency are probably getting reinfected quicker. So I think targeting those reinfection surveillance programs to people who who are injecting or maybe you could do it by stratifying by age if your prison population happens to have younger people injecting more frequently is probably the way to go. And as, 
as well. Like in some prisons, I think um, up in Queensland, the, the prisoner, the also person in prison themselves has opted, I, I think I might be reinfected, can I get a test? So also giving them some control over when they get tested is, is probably a good idea as well. Um, so yeah, it, it is kind of tricky to, to develop strategies just off that median time, but I think within the first year, I'd say it's it's quite crucial. Yeah. And maybe every three to every three months is probably a good interval. Perfect, Joanne. I'm I'm curious, um, your national hepatitis C elimination strategy for, for prisons. Um, is there any um, guidance for the rest of the world regarding timing of reinfection based on risk factors or not? Um, was that included in the elimination strategy? And if so, um, what was used? Do you know if there was any other evidence that was used to inform that recommendation? I I actually don't know if that is in the in the prison strategy. Andrew, is that testing interval in there? Sorry, lucky I've, I've got you here to fall back on. Yeah. I think Nadine, you're probably referring to our um, best practice recommendations for hepatitis care in the prisons. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, yes. And we didn't, or actually Beck Winter, who's the champion of that document, is on the call too. Uh, I'm pretty sure we didn't specify a testing frequency in screening for reinfection. We just we just encouraged retesting and retreatment. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Really depends on your your population, the proportion of people injecting drugs, how frequently they're injecting, harm reduction coverage. So, I guess probably differs between between different prison settings. Yeah. And Rebecca Winter is saying that perhaps in the document they recommended you recommended annual, annual. testing. So that's yeah. okay. I'm waiting a bit more pedantic, aren't? <laughs> oh no, I would probably favor your approach at three to six months but yeah um, the, the, and you just just one other comment with regard to our, our recommendations document it's a mix of uh, pragmatism realism and aspirational goals for the right recommendations. Right. <laughs> right you're maybe more realistic with that recommendation yeah yeah perfect i'll uh swing over to julia for the next question Thank you, Nadine. Um, so 80% of reinfections occurred on um, release from prison post release. Um, how can corrections and community work together to mitigate reinfection and ensure treatment in a timely manner? Yeah, so I think that 80% was among the people that were released and reincarcerated. So this is a really great question. And I think I'll probably, I'm going to pass off again to Tim at some point because um, he has a lot of experience um, in this care navigation. Uh, but just again, highlighting, we we don't really know when the reinfection occurred. So because we just do that midpoint, it, it's not always clear whether it did occur in the community or in prison. Uh, but our, our midpoint for 80% of them was while they were in out in the community. Um, so first, I think with the linkage to care um, and uh, sort of, I, I think there needs to be before someone is released, if it's possible, because I know some people get released a little bit unexpectedly, um, there really needs to be an individual assessment of, of what this person's needs are. And this should involve the person themselves. So it shouldn't just be something that's set up, you know, by the prison health. Let's ask the person, what do they want when they're released? So can we get them uh, linked with drug health services, mental health services, housing, housing services, and whatever else they may need? Because it's got to be extremely difficult going back into the community, particularly if you've been there for a really long, long time in prison and you don't have anywhere to live or anything else. So I think we really need to, to support people there. Um, and besides that assessment, the other thing that I think is crucial is that the community and the prison health really need to work together and build um, sort of strong collaborative capacity to work together for, to get the best outcomes for these people. And with that, I think involving people like case support workers or, or peer support workers to help with the care navigation could really improve that and significantly enhance engagement and, you know, build trust with this population. 
Um, aside from that, I, as not being a clinician or, or working in prisons, um, I, I will um, pass back to Tim to discuss sort of some of the sort of challenges he's found in the clinical setting, but that's my sort of overall perspective of it. So thank you so much for the question, Julia. No, thank you for the answer. And I think it's really important that we have those interventions with people when they're in prison and we can find out if they have partners at home that may need treating or testing and friend groups. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. More holistic approach to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Joanne. Tim, we're not hearing you. Um... Uh, so I can pass on to Jack Stone unless Tim, you have anything that you'd like to add. Yeah, and I, I guess just on that reinfection, I think it's 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 making up a lot of um, our treatments as well in the prison at the moment. So sort of speaking to um, our uh, nurse consultant who uh, does the prescribing, we're probably seeing about fifty percent of treatments last year were uh, people who had previously been treated and had been reinfected. So. We're certainly seeing that that those high rates of um, we're seeing you know a considerable amount of reinfection, um, but in terms of the exact time frame of when that's occurring, uh, I don't have any further idea of it either, unfortunately, with certainty. I mean, reinfection definitely seems to be increasing over time. So, looking at sort of a national analysis we did, looking at the uptake of retreatment for reinfection, it's really peaked around 2020, 2021. And I'm going to analyze the data from 2022 to see what's going on. But it really it looks like the majority of that retreatment for reinfection is happening in the prison setting. So it's it's definitely something to keep an eye on, you know, and and keep retreating so that you know we can eventually get to the point where we can achieve those sustained declines in in incidents. Fantastic, and certainly makes an argument for not a one time treatment option in prison. It's you know as often as need be. That should be the no, exactly one time is is insane. No, as many times <laughs> as you need it. Absolutely, yep. <laughs> awesome. Um, Jack, yours is the most complicated study, and you did a great job uh, breaking it down into layman's terms for not um, mathematical modelers. Now, you know um, my passion for needle and syringe programs, and um, I will say that your paper doesn't make a good argument for them only in the absence or in the reduction, rather, the, of community treatment. I think it's dangerous if we wait until community treatment um, is reduced to begin to advocate for these. So I guess my question is, if you had to take your article to a policymaker um, or a politician and argue for needle and syringe programs just on the basis of the paper that you presented, mm -hmm. uh, and and your goal was to convince said policymaker or politician you're not going to leave the room until he, he or she says yes, but your data isn't that great to support it. How would you argue for needle and syringe programs with uh, the data that you presented? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question and a tough question, I think. Um, so with, with the data as it was, I think we can see you know, if things were to carry on as usual, um, as things have been to date, needle and syringe programs unlikely to be needed in prisons to achieve elimination by 2030. Now, that's terrible, terrible I, argument. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's not the <laughs> argument. Okay, keep going. <laughs> but what I would say is, uh, do we do we only want to? you know, reduce hepatitis C incidence by 80% by 2030. You know, what, if you sort of look at the numbers behind that figure, you can see introducing needle and syringe programs will achieve elimination faster than without. They'll make a bigger impact than without. So, you know, rather than getting 80, it might be 85. I can tell you the exact numbers without looking at it, but, you know, you're going to get more impact. Just looking at the probability of, Achieving elimination by 2030, I think, somewhat masks the impact of adding prison-based NSP. The other thing mm -hmm. is actually, 
we don't know which of those two scenarios we're going to fall in. Our community treatment rate is going to stay the same. Are they falling? I think we already know that they are falling in New South Wales. I'm looking for Andrew for nod, yes. So I think, you know, had that not been the case, it makes sense given the uncertainty as to what will happen going forward to introduce needle and syringe programs in prisons to safeguard against that potential. So that would be uh, along those sort of lines, that would be my argument. Now, going outside of what was presented, I completely agree with what Joanne said about arguments about multiple other benefits of prison based needle and syringe programs cost effectiveness, you know, even, even if there was a, a sort of quite a small impact, as it were, they can still be very cost effective, even cost saving. Um, so, you know, going building on the work that we're doing, uh, that I presented, sorry, we're looking at the cost effectiveness of scaling up prison-based hepatitis C treatment in New South Wales. And even though we're already going to hit elimination targets, or that's what the model suggests, it's still cost effective, highly cost effective to scale up prison-based hepatitis C treatment. So there's no reason why, just because we're on track for hepatitis C elimination, that these other harm reduction interventions cannot be a cost-effective intervention either to prevent health harms. Who sold? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Jack. Um, that's a, you know, NSPs are a whole nother topic for another day, but um, that was an excellent answer. And uh, I'll let Andrew make the next comment. Oh, Jack, I just wondered, because I know you do modeling in all sorts of countries and prison centers across the uh, globe. I wonder if how atypical or or maybe not atypical you feel new south wales is in comparison to other jurisdictions uh, nash internationally hmm. um and sort of the whole picture yeah i guess you know we, we, we've got that high fraction of or the high proportion of infections that look like they're attributable to prisons hmm. or, or recently released to prisoners how how a how typical is that of the rest of the globe? Do you think, and and also I guess we have that combination of quite substantive scale up of treatment already in the prison and OAT. So I wonder what those sort of factors how they would influence the outcomes in other settings. Mm, that's that's a great question. So I think certainly in terms of the contribution of incarceration from the modelling that we've done and you know. There's been modelling that I've led in Scotland, uh, the US uh, for hepatitis C, Ireland, uh, and then HIV, HIV elsewhere as well. And we, you know, we we know that incarceration contributes significantly to HIV transmission as well among good contact drugs. I think New South Wales is sort of quite typical. It's sort of that average um, sort of portion ever incarcerated. So USA is, you know, I think we know the incarceration rates in the USA are off the charts. I think it's sort of 85% of people inject drugs have ever been incarcerated and it's not once, it's not twice, it's sort of going up to 10 times easily. Um, and there, there's a much higher contribution of incarceration to transmission dynamics. Um, in Eastern Europe, on the other hand, you know, sentence stamps are a lot longer than they are in Australia and North America and, and Western Europe. So there, um, even though it's, it's funny, this sort of risk of prison, and I know, um, you know the, the instance among those injecting in Australian prisons, or at least you know, the reinfection is very high. That's what the Joanne presented. There's this trade-off between how much inject, you know, injecting drug use is going on in prisons and then how risky is it? And so, you know, it's really difficult to know how much, without measuring instance, how much uh, transmission is there going on within the prisons. And so that's that's quite a difficult one to know where Australia is in terms of that regard. I think based on the studies where we have instance estimates, I would say it's on the higher end. 
But in terms of interventions, I think uh, certainly OAT, it's among one of the highest coverages I've seen in a, in a, in a prison sort of sector, sort of 30%. I know uh, in the UK, we have quite high coverage and good availability of OAT in prisons. But you know, globally, I think um, maybe 50 countries provide OAT in prisons. There's maybe 10 uh, that provide needle and syringe programs in prisons. And I think hepatitis C treatment just isn't necessarily as widespread as we would like it to be in the prison sector. So I think um, typical in some regards, quite atypical in others. Now, how generalizable are our results then as a consequence is quite difficult to say. You know, the model was calibrated to our setting or your setting of New South Wales. Mm. But I think, I think given what New South Wales are doing in the community and you compare that to what is going on globally, you know, OAT, New Zealand Strange programs, you look at places like Russia, which has been the highest population of people who inject drugs in the world, even North America, we don't have the same coverage of opioid agonist therapy in the community and even needle and syringe programs as you would in Australia. So in those settings, if they're not even doing that, prison, what, what they would do or could do in prisons would be even more important, I think, for achieving hepatitis C elimination. Sounds like you might be arguing that we need to commission modelling for each country uh, of the role of the prisons in elimination efforts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be nice. I think the the problem is we we just don't know how how long people spend spend in prison. There's there's yeah. no data. We we try to do it on a country by country basis, and we can't. Mm. Awesome. We are at the end of our phenomenal webinar. Um, again, I just want to wholeheartedly thank our three presenters. Just super awesome. And uh, thanks so much for sharing your amazing, amazing research. And certainly, I hope you've inspired uh, many of us on the call to um, work in this space and, and potentially um, see their faces on our webinars in the future. Um, for those of, who, of you who know INSU Prisons, we um, have, have had several workshops uh, in different countries around the world. Please feel free to visit our website to know the work that we've done. We have an up, a kind of upcoming INSU Prisons annual workshop in Geneva that will precede the INSU conference. So uh, for those of you who are interested in joining us, please uh, consider registering. Registration is now open and we have really a handful of amazing projects that are in the pipeline that are currently ongoing and uh, some of our work will be presented at this workshop and certainly um, as part of our broader family, we will keep you posted along the way um, with future webinars uh, and activities. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone um, and feel free to go to the INSU Prisons website to get involved and to join our mailing list. And please reach out to anyone on the executive committee if you would like to get involved um, or if you have any questions about any of our upcoming events. And finally, your feedback is valuable to us. We'd like to, we like to improve with every opportunity we have. So. Um, if you get the chance, please scan your Q the QR code and provide us with any feedback such that we can continue to make these events better and better with every coming year. So with that, um, thanks again and have a great evening or day, depending on where you are in the world. And thanks again, Jack, Tim and Joanne. Fabulous, fabulous work. Thank you so much, everyone.